A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. There was a wedding in Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples were also invited to the wedding. When the wine ran short, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, how does your concern affect me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servers, Do whatever he tells you. Now there were six stone water jars there for Jewish ceremonial washings, each holding twenty to thirty gallons. Jesus told the servers, Fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then Jesus told them, Draw some out now and take it to the head waiter. So they took it, and when the head waiter tasted the water that had become wine, without knowing where it came from, although the servers who had drawn the water knew, the head waiter called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves good wine first, and then when people have drunk freely, an inferior one. But you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this as the beginning of his signs in Cana in Galilee, and so revealed his glory, and his disciples began to believe in him. The Gospel of the Lord. O Mary, conceive without sin, pray for us who have recourse to thee. So we ponder this magnificent text of the wedding at Cana. There's so much that could be said about it. Every line is worthy of meditation. Maybe just a little word on the translation. We see this line that Jesus says to her, Woman, how does your concern affect me in this text? It's an unusual translation because the original Greek simply says, Woman, a beautiful mysterious reference to her as the new Eve, what to you and to me? What to you and to me? It's just those literal few words. So sometimes they get unusual translations from that. But I think the most appropriate translation is the uh, traditional one. What is this to you and to me? This question of wine, wine running out. What is this uh, to you and to me? Which I think would be a a more probably appropriate uh, translation given the context. In any case, I wanted to just look at one line, the final line one we don't often preach about, but it says his disciples began to believe in him. So in that moment, they began to see something mysterious in Christ. They'd met him. He had the humble exterior of the carpenter from Nazareth. They had befriended him only for a short period, just for about a week at this stage. But now they began to believe in him, not just in what he says, but in his person, They begin to see there is something more than mortal man here. There is something profound. So he begins to reveal the mystery of his divinity. And we notice that it's Our Lady who obtains this revelation of who Christ really is. They begin to literally, what it says in Greek, to look into him or to believe into him. So they don't just believe in what he says. They believe into him. They begin to pierce beyond the humble exterior and see that there is something mysterious here. The Lord is truly present with us. They begin to glimpse something of his divinity. In other words, we could say they begin to have Marian faith. Think about it. Our Lady is the only one in the world at that moment who really believes in Jesus, who really knows him. St. Joseph is long since gone to his eternal reward, but she knows that her son was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, by God himself. He has no human father. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit. So God is his father. So she knows that her son is divine. She looks into him as an eternal mystery. God from God, light from light. She alone knows it. But what she does now is she brings those first few disciples, just a handful of them, into that type of Marian faith. They begin to have now this deeper vision to realize what kind of a man can transform water into wine. This is the eternal Son of God. So they begin to have that revelation given to them. And that's what Our Lady, I think, always 
does. When we consecrate ourselves to her immaculate heart, we begin to have a deeper vision. I've heard people give me their testimony in many, many different places around the world that as soon as they made their consecration, they were drawn to the Blessed Sacrament. They began to see, yes, they already sort of believed maybe in their heads, but it began to sink into their hearts that Jesus is here. The Eucharistic amazement began to seize their hearts. The shock of the real presence is what a, a Swiss theologian in the 1960s called it. When you have that holy shock where you realize, ah, oh, he's really here. The Lord is truly present in that sacred, humble, fragile host. The Lord of glory dwells. That's what Our Lady does. She draws you into that deep vision so that you can see beyond the appearances and look into the truth of the substance of the reality of what is present. She also helps us to go beyond the exterior of the Scripture and see and taste the spiritual meaning hidden within the text. So I think that's one of the clear fruits of consecration to Mary, is that you begin to have that spiritual vision that the uh, disciples began to have, began to look into Jesus in that moment. In two days' time, we will be celebrating the great solemnity of the Immaculate Conception, one of my favorite feasts. I hope it's one of yours. That was the day I made my first total consecration to Mary uh, 15 years ago now. My life changed forever. I was drawn to the Blessed Sacrament. Within days, I began to be drawn to that great, great mystery of Christ's real living presence uh, among us. This feast will celebrate that Our Lady was conceived without the spiritual sickness of original sin. She knew nothing of actual sin. All throughout her life she was, in a word, immaculate. That poison injected into human nature by the original snake bite never entered into her sweet and beautiful heart. A few weeks ago, I went to the National Gallery. It's a real treasure. There's so many magnificent paintings there. And the one I wanted to see was the one by Leonardo da Vinci called The Virgin of the Rocks. I hope you've all been to see it. You can go anytime you want here uh, in London. Magnificent. It stands out compared to all the other paintings that are around it. Our Lady looks beautiful, radiant. The painting had been commissioned by the Confraternity of the Immaculate Conception, already three centuries before the dogma was proclaimed, that confraternity existed, and they asked da Vinci to do something beautiful for Mary. He truly did. But one thing that stands out in my memory is that if you look behind her, so she's standing in the, in the rocks beside a kind of cliff, but if you look through the cleft in the rocks behind her, you catch a glimpse of a, an unspoiled land. So that's the idea that da Vinci was trying to give, an unspoiled kind of glimpse of paradise, beautiful blue, clear water. And what he was saying is that Our Lady is paradise. She is, as Bernanos said, younger than sin. That original sin that took place and that turned paradise into what it would ultimately become, Our Lady knows nothing of it. So she is younger than original sin. She is paradise in person because she had to give flesh to the Son of God, the new Adam. Just as Adam was taken from the earth of the first paradise, now he was, the new Adam was taken from the virgin earth of Our Lady's human nature. So she is paradise in person. The word paradise in Scripture, I was using it for my retreat uh, recently when Jesus says to the good thief, this day you will be with me in paradise. The word paradise in Greek literally means a garden with trees. It's a mysterious word. It comes from an old Persian word, which means an enclosure. So a literally paradise is a garden with trees. And immediately you're brought back to the first page of Scripture, to that original paradise, that original, original garden with uh, the tree uh, of life. So it's a, it's a beautiful word. And that word, an enclosed garden, is what St. Louis Marie de Montfort used to say of Our Lady. She is the enclosed garden, the secret garden. She is that new paradise within which the, uh, the new Adam could dwell with, uh, with perfect peace and serenity, surrounded by nothing but love, nothing but purity, nothing but holiness. 
Our Lady had to be immaculate to give Christ his human flesh. Can you imagine to give the all-holy God, the thrice-holy God, to give him his features, to give him his body, give him his flesh? If you see the most uh, beautiful Christian artwork, you notice that the artist will sometimes show that the Christ child resembles his mother. I'm thinking of my favorite statue in the Basilica of St. Mary Majors in Rome. You all know it, I'm sure, one of the most famous Marian churches in the world. But there's the beautiful statue of Our Lady Queen of Peace. It's about 100 years old at this stage. But you notice the little Christ child resembles Our Lady. Their features are very similar. And that is the way that it would have been. But can you imagine the stunning perfection and holiness that Our Lady would have to have to be able to give God his human face? Not only is Our Lady the new paradise, but as we said, this Mass is the Mass of the new Eve. She is also the new Eve. This is a very ancient title that goes right back to St. Irenaeus, written in about the year 150 AD. It's a very bold title, a very honorific title, that there was a new Adam, Christ, but there is also a new Eve. And you know that Irenaeus had been ordained by St. Polycarp, great martyr, And St. Polycarp had been ordained by St. John himself. So this is something that really comes from the earliest times. If the church went astray in honoring Our Lady the way she does, she went astray at the very, very beginning. She went astray in the person of the great St. Polycarp, who failed to hand on to Irenaeus what he had received from St. John the Apostle himself. No, the church has not gone astray. If you go back to the most ancient churches, churches in Turkey, churches in the Holy Land, churches in uh, Egypt, the most ancient churches, you'll find that Our Lady is always honored and extolled. This phenomenon of Christians not honoring Our Lady is a recent thing. It is not part of the original church founded by Christ himself, handed on to his apostles and, and passed on faithfully since that time in and through the Holy Catholic Church. So just as there was an old Adam and an old Eve in the fall, both of them were involved. Think about it. Eve was indispensable. Eve was an essential part of the fall. Newman says the fall happened when Adam sinned because he was the one that God spoke to directly. He had the priestly uh, role, you know, that he had been given by the Lord. So the fall actually happened. That catastrophe happened for all of creation when he sinned. But Eve was totally indispensable to it. She was part of the fall of the world. And in the same way, God decreed that there be a new Eve, so that when the new Adam, the new high priest comes, that there would also be a new Eve to be part of the restoration of all things. Irenaeus said she untied the knot that the disobedience of Eve had tied. So Our Lady was indispensable in our salvation. That's just the way that God set it up. Yes, Jesus is the only Savior. He is the Redeemer, but he chose to associate Mary with him, that she would participate as a new Eve with the new Adam in the redemption. So much so that several popes have called Our Lady co-redemptrix. So not that she is the Redeemer. Christ is the Redeemer. Co just means with. She associates, she participates in the redemption. St. Augustine called her the cooperator in the redemption. So she's called to be uh, indispensable by Christ. Pope John Paul used that title uh, several times, seven times, I think. It was an excellent book written by Arthur Calkins, where he gives all of the, uh, the quotations of Pope John Paul, calling Our Lady the co-redemptrix, even though today, unfortunately, that title has fallen away a little bit. You don't hear people speaking about it uh, as often as I believe that we, we should speak about it, to show that Our Lady is essential in our salvation. She is the new woman, the new Eve. Eve means mother of all the living. And Our Lady, we know, is designated as our mother by Christ himself on the cross. She is the new mother of all the living, the mother of all those who live by the grace of God. So she is indispensable. That's why we call her mother of the church. Sometimes we use these titles without pondering them, but she's mother of the church in a special way because she's mother of the grace that all those who enter the church receive. She was involved in it as a new Eve with the new Adam. One of the most interesting things that Pope John Paul said, it was in a homily in uh, the shrine of Our Lady of the Dawn 
in Ecuador in January, uh, the 31st of January, a catechesis that he gave in that shrine. He says, her co-redemption did not cease when her life on earth ceased. I think that's very, very important. So yes, co-redemption, she was involved as a new Eve with the new Adam in, in uh, acquiring the grace of God for all of us in Calvary throughout uh, Christ's life. But he says her co-redemption, so her participation in my salvation, my redemption, and yours, does not cease when her life on earth ceases. So she enters into heaven, but she's still involved in our salvation. And that is what we call her mediation of graces. So she helped to obtain grace, helped to acquire grace with Christ, but now she mediates grace. She is involved in our reception of those graces won 2,000 years ago in the here and now. And that's what Pope John Paul was getting at. If you go also to St. Mary Major's Basilica, you see above the apse, so you know the, the apse, there's a magnificent mosaic, and you see Our Lady sitting right beside Christ. They're actually on the same throne. It's magnificent. This is how the Church of Rome honors Our Blessed Lady. Christ is sharing His throne in heaven with Our Lady. Because she shared the throne of the cross, where grace was won, she now shares in Christ's glory. She now shares in His throne, in His distribution of all of those graces. So she is a mediatrix of all graces. Another controversial statement today, but it goes back hundreds of years. St. Bernard insisted that Our Lady is the mediatrix of all graces. She is somehow mysteriously involved from her place at the right hand of Christ. She is involved in the dispensation of all grace. Pope John Paul said, if you want to get an idea of it, a snapshot of it, look at Cana. Look at what happens. If you want to know what Our Lady is doing in heaven now, she's doing what she was doing then 2,000 years ago, watching over people, watching out for their needs, whispering to her son, they have no wine, they need help. Pope John Paul says she brings within the power of the, uh, the radius of the Messiah's power all of our needs. So that's what she's doing. She's bringing us to Christ, speaking to us, uh, speaking to him on, on our behalf, and then speaking to us on his behalf. Do whatever he tells you. She becomes the interpreter of the will of God for us. So that is her role, mysteriously glimpsed at Cana, but now going on at the wedding banquet in heaven that we are all called to participate in. As you probably know, seven million Catholics sent a petition to the Pope a few years ago asking him to proclaim what I have just said as a dogma, proclaim a new fifth final Marian dogma of Our Lady's role in the redemption, her participation, you could call it co-redemption, and her mediation now of graces in heaven. It's important that the church really proclaims it solemnly because there's so much confusion. You still have Catholics in the church who can say, well, I don't really have a devotion to Mary, as though it's something optional, like as though she's another saint. Well, she's really the mother of the saints, mother of the church, queen of all saints. And so if the church defines it more solemnly, it will be clearer, then everybody will be able to live according to that, uh, that grace. And remember that when a dogma is proclaimed, there's always a powerful outpouring of grace. When the Immaculate Conception was proclaimed in the 1850s, three years later, I believe it was, our Blessed Lady appeared in Lourdes and said, I am the Immaculate Conception, confirming what the Church had said, and all the miracles, thousands of miracles, all the conversions, all the graces that have come through the Shrine of Lourdes and all the other things connected to Lourdes were all a, a, a result, a fruit of the Church proclaiming that dogma. So now if the church proclaims this beautiful, magnificent final dogma, you can be sure that there will be an extraordinary outpouring of grace. It almost happened in the 1920s. There were three commissions established by the Pope, thanks to Cardinal Mercier of Belgium. He had it really uh, done so well, the Pope almost proclaimed that dogma, but for some reason at the very end, he decided not to. Someone says it was because uh, the assumption had not yet been proclaimed. So you see there's a kind of logic in the dogmas. The four dogmas speak about Our Lady's life on earth, her immaculate conception, her motherhood of God, her assumption into heaven, uh, her perpetual virginity. So it stops at that moment when she gets into heaven. But Fulton Sheen, who was a, a, a student of Cardinal Mercier, he believed passionately 
that now the church has to put the crown on all of that by proclaiming what she does in heaven. Yes, we've proclaimed all of the dogmas as far as her getting into the glory of heaven, but what is she doing now? What is her role in our lives today? And so there must be some solemn explanation, proclamation of that by the church. I personally believe, and this is just a personal belief, that the triumph of the Immaculate Heart, Our Lady spoke about it 100 years ago, uh, in 2010, Pope Benedict confirmed that it's not yet fulfilled, that prophetic dimension of Fatima. I think it's connected to the proclamation of the dogma, of the, of the, of the final dogma, that that will unleash such a powerful grace for the church. If you think about it, it will be as though everybody is living the total consecration to Mary. For now, some of us are trying to live that you know, we go to Jesus through Mary, with Mary, and as I said, when you do it, she leads you to discover the Eucharist, to really love the Eucharist, to be passionate about her son in the Eucharist. That's what the fruit of consecration is. But imagine that for the whole church. If the whole church co knows that we have to go to Jesus with Mary, through Mary, if we want to have the maximum grace, I think it will lead to something truly extraordinary. And I know that St. Maximilian Kolbe said something similar, that it will lead to Christ receiving a kind of love from the whole church that will be truly wonderful to behold. So we pray that that will happen. Interestingly, uh, just to finish, you know, Pope Benedict, as a young theologian, he was opposed to that dogma being proclaimed. So in the 60s and the 70s, he said, I know that popes have uh, taught this, but I think it still needs to be further studied before it is proclaimed solemnly. He remained uh, in that frame of mind right up until the time he was a cardinal, even though he seems to have had a little change of heart in his understanding of Mariology. If you study his, his writings closely, there's a turning point, and I think it's 1986 when he writes the Ratzinger Report, magnificent book, an interview with the Pope, and he says, you know, when I was a young theologian, there were two things about Our Lady that I didn't understand. So he gives two examples. One was what the fathers of the church said, that she is the conqueror of all heresies. And the other one was a line from St. Bernard where he says, De Maria numquam satis. De Maria of Mary, you can never say enough, or you can never say too much, because she's only ever going to bring you to Christ. So you can never proclaim her too highly. He said, I couldn't understand that when I was a young theologian back in Germany. He says, but now I understand it. And especially I see that in those places where she is no longer honored, so certain parts of Germany, certain parts of Europe, she was no longer receiving any honor. He says, all of the heresies from 20 centuries have all come back into the church. As soon as she left or got banished by her own children, all of the heresies, all of the things she had obtained a victory over came back to roost in the church. So he says, I see it in practice. Clearly it has happened. As soon as she's not honored, heresy holds its sway. So it's a beautiful uh, insight from Cardinal Ratzinger. So you see this development of his Marian doctrine, but he still says no to the dogma. He thinks the language maybe isn't right and it's not maybe the right time, even though the doctrines are, are probably true, but he says we need more time. Then in the year 2007, I think there's a continuous progression because he gives a homily on the 11th of May, 2007, where he boldly and strongly proclaims every grace we receive comes through Mary. Nobody receives grace that is not in some way connected to Our Lady in Heaven. So without saying the words mediatrix of all graces, he taught the doctrine. And then just to finish, the most curious thing of all, I don't know if you know this, but on the day that he announced his resignation as Pope, so the, was it the Feast of Our Lady of Lourdes, 11th of February, 2013? So after having opposed the, you know, the, the, the proclamation of Our Lady since the 1960s as the mediatrix of all graces, co-redemptrix, he writes a letter to the shrine of Altotting, the Marian shrine of Bavaria in Germany. And in that letter, so this is, he's just about to leave, he's just announced his resignation, one of his final acts. He writes this beautiful letter and he calls Our Lady in that letter mediatrix of all graces, uses the term specifically. So people were a bit baffled. Why does he do this at the very end after having not used that term as far as we can see uh, all of the, the way through his, his ministry? Maybe there was an insight that he received as Pope, but I, I think the best interpretation that I heard is that everybody knew he had been a little bit opposed to the dogma, so the final Marian dogma, 
And so he thought that maybe for his successor, so a pope who comes after him at some point will receive the grace to proclaim that dogma, it was important for that pope to know that just as Pope Benedict signed off, he showed that he was not opposed to that teaching. So he gave it his stamp of approval so that a future pope would not have that fear because, you know, Pope Benedict is not an ordinary scholar. He's the greatest theologian probably that we've seen for many, many years, many, many decades. So he's an extraordinary, has an extraordinary mind. And so it would have been a bit of a problem for a subsequent pope to maybe think that that pope didn't want it when he was such a great uh, theologian. So he left at the very end that little green light, that little uh, stamp of approval to go ahead and proclaim Our Lady as mediatrix of all graces so that we can receive all the graces that are available to us, that the whole church can receive them. When she's put into her proper place in our minds, in our hearts, when she's honored in heaven as she is, uh, honored on earth as she is in heaven, as we said, there will be such an outpouring of grace. So don't give up on that dogma. I know it's gone a little bit quiet of late. People are not really talking about it, but keep praying for it. I think it's really, really important. There are spiritual causes and spiritual mysteries that we don't fully understand, but you can be sure if the church crowns Our Lady, honors her as she ought to be honored and loved, as God wills that she be honored and loved, we will be flooded in a new outpouring of grace. Oh.